All right, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the glorious Jesus. This is lesson number four, Jesus greater than Moses. Uh, in your Bibles, that would be Hebrews in chapter number three, uh, is where we're going to start. So just a little review of what we've done so far. Uh, this epistle was uh, written to certain Christian Jews who, because of persecution, were considering returning to their former religion. So the author of Hebrews encourages them to be faithful and the way he does this is that he argues that Christianity is superior to every form of Judaism and all the elements in Judaism and is in fact a fulfillment of the Jewish religion. Um, and so as we read through Hebrews in successive chapters, the author demonstrates how Christ is superior to the Jewish prophets as well as angels uh, who uh, the Jews held in high esteem as spiritual beings and so on and so forth. So you know, the whole book is about how is Jesus greater than and fulfills all of the elements of the Jewish religion. So once he's done this, the author is going to go on to compare Jesus um, uh, to the most prestigious Jewish leader in their history and that was Moses. Okay, so that's where we are in this particular book. So let's do just a little bit of background on Moses. Uh, Moses was born during the Jewish bondage in Egypt, approximately 1500 BC. He was raised uh, by an Egyptian queen who found him in a basket after his mother hid him due to a persecution of male children by the Egyptians against the Jewish people. They were becoming too numerous. Uh, the Egyptians felt threatened and so they started this uh, uh, this persecution uh, by trying to destroy all the male born uh, children. Uh, he was educated at the Egyptian court, but at 40 he tried to uh, lead a, the Jewish people in a kind of a revolt and he uh, ended up killing an Egyptian and because of that he escaped and lived in the desert for another 40 years. Uh, we know that God called him at the age of 80 to return to Egypt and to lead the Jews uh, to their promised land. The land had been promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so on and so forth. The Lord performed great miracles through Moses in order to free the people from the Egyptians, but because of their lack of faith and their disobedience, a journey from Egypt to the promised land, a journey that may have required perhaps a few months, actually lasted 40 years as the people led by Moses and his brother Aaron wandered in the desert for four decades. Now during these 40 years, however, Moses, or God through Moses, gave to these people the law, gave them the tabernacle, gave them uh, social and food laws, the priestly and the sacrificial system. So in the desert, they became a new and structured society through Moses' leadership. Moses, of course, himself disobeyed God, and like the generation that left Egypt with him, he did not enter the promised land, but only saw it from afar before he died. He was, however, considered the greatest of Jewish leaders and a great source of authority for the Jews, okay? So in chapter three of the book of Hebrews, um, uh, the author will now compare Moses to Christ. Now this would be very meaningful to Jewish Christians, and this is why the authors of all the Gospels mention Moses over 80 times, more than any other figure in the Old Testament, because Moses was such an important character, such an important figure to the, to the Jewish mindset. Now Moses was seen as a type or a preview of Christ in the Old Testament, and New Testament writers often pointed this out. For example, Moses uh, lifting up the serpent in the desert, we know that story, Numbers 21, four to nine, the Jews had been bitten by, uh, by snakes and, and so on and so forth, and they cried out to God, and God told Moses you know, to raise up a, a serpent on a staff, and when people would look at that, they would be healed, so you know, Moses, lifted up a serpent in the desert, Jesus was list, lifted up on the cross, John chapter three, verse 14. Uh, Moses 
uh, giving manna in the desert, feeding the people with manna. Of course, we know God is doing this, but He's doing it through Moses. Uh, Exodus 16, Jesus uh, not giving manna to the people, but actually being the bread of heaven Himself. Doesn't He say, I'm the bread, I'm the bread of life, right? John 6, 31. Uh, both Moses and Jesus uh, were threatened to be killed as babies. Moses' mother put him in a basket and hid him. Jesus' parents uh, escaped to uh, Egypt to avoid uh, uh, Jesus being killed, Matthew 2.16. Both were deliverers of their people and both of them were initially rejected by the people they came to, uh, to lead and to serve. And so the author of Hebrews will continue to draw parallels between Jesus and Moses to show Jesus' superiority and he will draw parallels between their followers as well in order to emphasize the importance of faithfulness. So let's take a look at the outline here, the section that we're going to be studying, chapter three, verse one, to chapter four, verse 13. Um, this section can be divided into two parts. Uh, the first part, a comparison of Moses and Jesus in five areas. So Moses uh, was with the chosen people, leading them to the promised land. He was an apostle of liberation. He was related to the high priest. Aaron was his brother. He was a servant of the house of God. That was Moses, the author will show. Jesus, on the other hand, was part of the holy brethren. His call was celestial. He was an apostle of salvation. He was and is a high priest of salvation. He is not a servant of the house of God, he is the builder of the house of God. All right, so he shows this comparison. The second outline is a warning to Jesus' followers. Uh, he tells them that Moses' generation did not enter into the promised land because of disbelief and disobedience. That generation that left, they died in the desert, right? Only the following generation went into the promised land. And so the, the, the lesson for his readers is you need to be careful not to follow their example, okay? So in the previous chapter, the author billboarded the idea that Jesus is like a high priest, you know, faithful and merciful, okay? Remember what billboarding means, right? You're driving along, you see a billboard, McDonald's, you know, next exit. The McDonald's is not right where the billboard is, but you know it's coming. Well, the writer in Hebrews billboards. He, he, he throws in a word or an idea. He doesn't explain it right away, but it's a billboard. It tells you this idea is coming, okay? So in the previous chapter, the author billboarded the idea that Jesus is like a high priest. He's faithful, he's merciful. Now he'll develop this idea in chapters four and five, but first he compares Jesus to Moses because Moses appeared historically before the high priest. And as an historical figure, he had a greater impact on the Jews than any priest. So if he's going to make comparisons, uh, comparisons he makes them in order. Moses comes before Aaron, so he's going to compare Jesus to Moses before he'll compare Jesus to Aaron, okay? He also introduces the picture of his readers as pilgrims to the heavenly land, thus establishing a basis of comparison between themselves, Jesus' followers, and Moses' followers, who were also pilgrims on their way to their promised land, except their promised land was here on earth. So let's go to chapter three, verse one. He says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. They're holy because they have been sanctified, they've been set apart by Christ. They're brethren because they have a brother in Christ by virtue of His incarnation. He became human. He relates to them as a human, as a brother. A heavenly calling because they have been called by the gospel to come to a celestial place, a celestial country a celestial paradise, a celestial promised land, heaven. 
Our promised land is celestial, not geographical. We are not nation building, we're not looking for a cultural homeland to call our own. We are simply passing through this world on our way to the next world that we've been called to by Jesus. And I make a little parenthetical statement that is politically germane, if you wish, for the moment. One of the large differences, you know, uh, between Christianity and Islam, for example, is that Islam is trying to establish a kingdom here, a theocracy here, okay, where their religious principles will guide the political principles and the political process. And they, you know, and many of them, uh, not all, mind you, but many, the ones we hear about in the news, are willing to uh, you know, capture territory by any means in order to impose their theological uh, kingdom. Christianity has no interest in doing that. Yes, we want to vote for people of like mind. Yes, we're looking for candidates, for example, that are believers and so on and so forth, of course. You know. But our purpose is not to establish some sort of Christian theocracy here on earth, no. We're pilgrims, we're passing through. We're not, we're not staying here, all right? So consider Jesus, he says. You have been called, should those of you who have been called should consider or compare Jesus, he says, in light of Moses. See how Jesus compares to him. So the author compares three things. First, the apostle of our confession. Moses was an apostle, meaning he was one sent with authority. He gave God's word to the people and he led them to the promised land. Jesus, on the other hand, is God's messenger also who brings freedom, freedom from death and freedom from eternal salvation. It is Jesus that we confess to be saved, not Moses. I'm assuming everyone here has been baptized, okay? Well, when, when you're in the water and, and whoever is baptizing you asks you a question, does that person ask you, do you believe that Moses is a faithful leader of the people? No, we never asked any questions about what we believe about Moses or Aaron or Isaiah or Elijah or John the Baptist or Peter the Apostle. There's only one person that we confess, and that's Jesus. That's the reason we're in the water, right? I mean, we believe He's the Son of God. We believe that He's paid the price for our sins. We express our faith in Him, how? Well, through baptism. Why? Because that's how He's asked us to express faith in Him, among other things. And so Jesus is the apostle of our confession. And the writer is saying to his readers, Jesus is the apostle of your confession, not Moses. Secondly, he is the high priest of our confession. Moses was related to the high priest, his brother Aaron, and he gave the instructions for the priesthood and the sacrificial system. Notice if you read in the Old Testament, it isn't Aaron giving the instructions, it's Moses giving the instructions. Moses is the one with the authority. Moses is the one that sanctifies, if you wish, Aaron for the priesthood, that prepares everything, right? But in our case, Jesus is the high priest, and by His own sacrifice, He saves us. Now, the amazing thing is that Jesus is both high priest and sacrifice, an idea that the writer is presenting here, billboarding here, but he's going to explain it in detail later on. For now, he's saying to them, Jesus is the apostle of our confession. Jesus is the high priest of our confession. Thirdly, faithful. He was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was in all his house. Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter three, verse two. Moses was faithful, yes. The author doesn't detract from Moses. He was faithful to Israel and to the mission to which he was called by God. Jesus also was faithful 
but he had a different mission and a different role. So let's keep reading. He says, for he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. So Moses was faithful as a servant in God's household, faithfully delivering the law without changing it, faithful in his post as leader. He was part of the spiritual temple that God was building. Jesus, on the other hand, is not a servant in the house. He is the Son of God over the house. The law was His word. He created the people and the nation. He established the foundation for it with His own blood. So the author says that in His role of son and builder, Jesus was, like Moses, faithful. However, by virtue of his position in relationship to the house of God, he is greater than Moses. In verse three, you know, he says, uh, worthy of more glory. He says that about Jesus. You know, we appreciate the house, but we give the award to who? Well, the architect. The, ar the architect is the one that gets the prize, that gets the applause, that gets the honor, not the house. So the readers of this uh, uh, epistle are tempted to return to Judaism and Moses was the human embodiment of that religion. And so the writer demonstrates how Jesus is greater than Moses and now warns them about what a return to Moses would actually mean for them. And so now in verse 6b, he talks about Moses and Jesus and gives a, a warning. He says, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our, uh, our hope firm until the end. I mean, the entire warning that he gives is summarized right here in this verse. We are the household, the temple, the family that God is building and over which He has put Christ. We continue in this position if, that's the key word, if, notice, a, if we hold fast, meaning we're steady, we're unmoved, like a ship in the storm, it just keeps plowing through the storm. If, he says, we have confidence, we hold fast, not in fear and panic or complaint, but with confidence. Yes, there are problems. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, there are issues. Yes, there are obstacles. Yes, we fail. But we're not walking through life as Christians with all of these things going on around us, panicky, frightened, whining, complaining, discouraged. No, he says. What kind of witness is that? No, 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 he says. You're going through this life, whatever the Christian life brings to you in this fallen world, you're walking through it with confidence. and boasting of our hope. I mean, the reason why we hold fast, why? Well, because we are free from condemnation and the fear of death, Romans 8, 1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I'm not, you know. And what is the worst attack? Satan, the accuser, constantly saying to us in so many different ways that we're not good enough, we're not pure enough, we're not serving enough, we're not giving enough, we're not trying hard enough, whatever. We need, to, we need to memorize that scripture, Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say there's no condemnation for those who are perfect in Christ Jesus, for those who never make any mistakes in Christ Jesus, and so on and so on. He just said, you're in Christ. Biblical hope is confident expectation, not wishing. I'm not, I'm not wishing I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. I know it. Why? Because of my performance? No. Because of my faith. That's why. If 
he says. We are firm until the end. We maintain this firm confidence until the end. Look at Job. Look how much he got beat up. I mean, really beat up. I mean, the things that happened to him, any one of those things, but when I think about it, imagine all your children are killed in a day. I mean, uh, you lose one child, or I mean, it's just incredible, the pain. Imagine losing them all. And yet, the confidence that God was in charge and that God was there and so on and so on, despite his misunderstanding, despite the fact that he didn't know what was going on, he never, ever let go, never. So the true Christians then and now are those who believe God when He promises eternal life and live in such a way that demonstrates that that promise is true until the end. So the author moves from this opening comment to give some practical examples of the time where God's people didn't have this confidence, didn't have this perseverance, and were unable to maintain their hope, and consequently were punished because of this. So the author appeals to them through a warning and a promise. First, the warning against disbelief. And that warning is based on Psalm 95, uh, verse seven to 11. He quotes it here, so we begin in verse seven to nine. He says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, and here he's quoting that Psalm, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for years. So he compares the, 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 the Jewish rebellion under Moses to the Jewish Christians contemplating leaving Christ. He said, you, know, you, you people are acting the same way that they acted in the time of Moses. And he quotes a scripture that comments on that time. Actually, God Himself speaking or commenting about what He thought of that, uh, you know, that lack of faith. Then in verse 10 and 11, He says, Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So God's punishment was to prohibit them from entering the promised land which was referred to as rest. You know, I've told you before in the Bible, many times the writers, they refer to the same thing in a variety of ways. So here the promised land is referred to as rest. Verse 12, he says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So the warning is to guard against disbelief because it leads to falling away. And here the author equates falling away from Christ with falling away from the true and living God. Like he doesn't pull any punches here. You're not just falling away from a newfangled religion here. If you fall away from Christ, you're falling away from God just like they did under Moses in the desert. Verse 13. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So he says that the root of the problem, of course, is sin. I mean, sin leads to disbelief, disbelief to apostasy, apostasy leads to punishment. He exhorts them to you know, encourage each other, therefore, in the battle against sin. While it is today, they must encourage each other. Don't put it off. And this is necessary because sin is deceptive and they can easily fall. So they need to encourage each other every day because all of us are tempted every day and we often underestimate the power of sin. Many times we, we think we're stronger than we really are. So we go on in verse 14, he says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So he reminds them that the rewards of hope go only to those who are faithful to the end. As strong as the end as you are at the beginning. Remember I've told you many times, it's easy to start something, it's not that easy to finish something. Easy to get married, I'm in love, yeah, let's go. You know, it's not so easy to finish. You know? And sometimes it's not just your partner, it's not so easy to finish because there's illness and you lose jobs and the kids drive you crazy and whatever. You know, it's just not easy to finish.
So it's not how fast you go, it's if you finish faithfully or not. And what he's saying is daily encouragement is needed to accomplish them. Why do you, you ever wonder, why do you think we, we meet together three times a week? People say, well, it's not in the Bible. You know, the Bible doesn't say we have to come on Sunday night. The Bible doesn't say we have to come on Wednesday. Well, no, it doesn't. Of course not. It doesn't even say how long we have to Technically, technically, we could just pop in, take communion, go home. I mean, if we wanted to fulfill just the technical requirements, meet on the Lord's Day for the communion, that's it, we're done. One and gone. But there are so many other passages that tell us you have to encourage each other, you have to strengthen each other, you have, to burden, you have to carry each other's burdens, you have to encourage, pray for one another and so on. How do we do that one another stuff if we don't see each other? That's the purpose. The wisdom of the leadership of our congregation uh, says, you know, it is a good thing that we meet these three times. Yes, is it inconvenient? Well, absolutely. Of course it's inconvenient. Many of you I see come on Wednesday night, you're still in your work clothes. Some of you have probably not even been home. Straight from work, you know, choke down a burger, get to church. You know, young moms with kids. They come home from school, let's go hurry up. You know. But we're shooting for a higher purpose here. Let's not lose, let's not lose the, the, the reason why we do these things. We're not punching a card, we're not trying to get brownie points. We're here because we need each other. That's why we're here. We need, I need to see your face, you need to see my face. I need to know you're still faithful, you need to know that I'm still faithful, I'm still going at it. I need to know that despite the difficulties in your life, you're still wanting to please the Lord and, and do His will because it encourages me when it's my turn to suffer, my turn to be discouraged, my turn to feel like quitting. 15 to 19, he says, while it is said, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked Him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was He angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did He swear that they would not enter His rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of disbelief. So the author gives an example of Israelites who perished in the desert as a result of their unfaithfulness. The point is that their sins didn't disqualify them, it was the unfaithfulness that their sins caused that led to failure. It wasn't because they weren't perfect, it wasn't because they failed to obey at times different things, it wasn't that, that that destroyed them, it was that they gave up, they quit, they stopped being faithful. So this example is made for the readers of the epistle who because of disbelief in Christ are being tempted to abandon the journey of faith that they are on. He tells them to encourage one another in this journey so they will finish faithfully. Then he goes on from the warning to the promise. The promise in chapter four verses one to 10. The promise of heaven was couched in various terms. The promise of glory, the promise of eternal life, the promise of rest, all these terms, metaphors for the same thing, right? Going to heaven. For the Jews in the Old Testament, two types signified or pointed to a heavenly reward. Remember I told you what types are, they're previews of what is to come. So in the Old Testament, there were two types that pointed to a heavenly reward to come in the future. The first was the Sabbath, an earthly rest from work in order to concentrate on one's relationship with God and pointed to a time of unbroken fellowship with Him that would eventually come. Now the reason why we don't keep the Sabbath as Christians today is that we have already begun that unbroken fellowship with God. In the Old Testament, it was a type pointing to what we already have today. We don't need to set apart a 24-hour period to symbolize what will eventually arrive with the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah has come. We are spiritually united with God through Christ. We have knowledge of God through the Word. 
We have spiritual regeneration through the Holy Spirit. It's something we already have. We're not waiting for it, we've got it already. So as Christians, they and we are enjoying the everlasting Sabbath rest and we will do so if we continue to the end. They were, they were looking forward to the Sabbath rest that we have and the Sabbath that they practice, the, point, the putting aside of time to you know, have work on their relationship with God symbolized what was to come. Well, we, we don't have to symbolize that anymore. We've got it. Okay? That's why we're not Sabbatarians. Another type in the Old Testament of heaven was the promised land which was to be the homeland for God's people, but really it pointed to the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. It was a type for that. That kingdom is not political, nor is it geographical, it is spiritual. Christ established it with His death and resurrection, and all who believe and obey the gospel enter into the kingdom, right? Born again. So in this passage, the author mixes these images saying that the rest was to be had in the promised land. The Jews looked forward to a rest or reward when they reached the promised land, which was Canaan, but most of them did not make it because of disbelief and they died in the desert as a result. So the writer uses the spiritual meaning of these words to tell them that they will not reach their reward of heaven either for the very same reason. So we read in verse uh, one, chapter four, verse one. He says, therefore let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, okay, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. So he's saying, be afraid lest while the promise of rest, you know, heaven, is right in front of you, you fall short of actually obtaining it. I mean, the promise is still before them, but should be frightened if they're falling back from it through disbelief. And he's saying, you know, the Jews, they didn't actually get to the geographical promised land for disbelief. Well, if you disbelieve, you will, you will not get to, not the geographical promised land, but to the spiritual promised land, which is heaven. Verse two, for indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So he suggests that the problem in the desert was the people's doubt that God could bring them to the promised land. They didn't really believe that He would do it. We're out here eating this manna, wandering around the desert. When are we ever going to get there? Ah, he's not going to bring. He brought us out here to kill us. You know, who's this Moses anyway? You know, this was the whining and moaning that kept on. I mean, the miracles that they had seen and yet still. Christians, he says, like the Israelites, have received the promise of rest, the good news, salvation, eternal life. They've received that promise. However, they shouldn't act like the Israelites who didn't enter because they heard, but they didn't continue believing and so could not complete the journey. They need to be careful that they don't do that themselves. Verse three to eight, he says, for we who have believed enter that rest just as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time, just as he has said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Those who believe need to understand that the rest is still available to those who persevere. It has not been withdrawn despite the failure of some to enter in because of disbelief. So just because other people don't believe 
doesn't mean that God has removed the promise. The promise is still there regardless of what other people do. He quotes a passage from Psalms written long after the events in the desert uh, showing that the rest that God offered the Jews was still present in David's day, 500 years after Moses. The idea was that the rest wasn't just for Moses' generation, but for every generation who would believe. That's why he says, so long as it is today, the rest is there. The promise of heaven is there today, tomorrow, the next day, and the day after, and so on and so forth. But he, he wraps all the time element, you know, today, tomorrow, next week, all into one word, today. If you're alive today, that promise is still there. He then quotes Joshua and says that if Joshua's conquest of the land would have fulfilled God's promise of rest, well then David would not be talking about it as a possibility centuries later. You know, the promise remained alive. In other words, them going into Canaan and you know, claiming it and settling in it, that didn't fulfill everything about the rest that God had made a promise of. There was still something to come. We know what that is, right? That's heaven. Unlike the Jews who thought that in getting the land they had received everything, the author is saying that the best is yet to come. Verse nine and 10. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. So he confirms that the promise of rest remains. He explains that the promise is not something you own, it's something you enter into, like the land, you know, they owned the land, they fought for the land, they defended the land. He said, God's promise of ultimate rest, not like the promise of the land, you don't own it, you can't own it, you enter into it. And what you enter into is not described, only that it will be different than what is going on here. So to Christian Jews who are discouraged, many doubt that the suffering is worth the goal, that the goal is even out there, the writer assures them that as God rested from His work, so will they rest from their work. So will they rest, so will we rest. All right, one little section left here, okay. So then he summarizes his warning, verse 11. He says, therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. So don't repeat the mistake of the Israelites. Christians are in the process of entering into the rest. Don't fall back because of disobedience, which will lead to disbelief and apostasy and ultimately failure. Don't do that. Be diligent, be zealous to enter the rest. And of course, in Acts 2.42, we know how to do this, right? They persevered, what, daily, continually in the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, prayer, you know, so on and so forth. Falling away from church is the sign that one is falling away from the rest. So he equates you know, your walk with Christ today. If you're faithful to that, that walk will lead you into the rest. But if you're not faithful to that walk, then you will not enter the rest either. Verse 12 and 13, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So listen, he says, to the warning because it comes from God's word which is powerful and not to be ignored. And he makes several comparisons to show the power of the word. It's living and active, you know, meaning it's productive. It's, it's a sword, it's effective, it's sharp. You know, he says the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, the thoughts, the intentions, only something very, very sharp could actually divide these kind of things. And then he says laid bare, meaning nothing is hidden from God's view or His word. So although the chapter doesn't end here, the thought ends here. The example and warnings and punishments and explanations given in God's word concerning disobedience and disbelief, the writer says, should be heeded because God's word, including His promises and His punishments, are absolutely sure. 
this warning is as real for us today as it is for them. So let me just finish out here one more slide, two more slides. So here's the summary. The author begins by comparing Moses and Jesus along different lines to demonstrate that Moses, even as a faithful servant and leader of the Jews, is not comparable to Jesus, who saves souls and actually builds the household of God which Moses only served. He goes on then to warn them that they will fail to reach their goal, which is heaven, for the very same reasons that Moses and the Israelites faith failed to reach their goal, which was the land of Canaan. And what are those reasons? Disobedience and disbelief. So he says, be careful. And he reassures them that the rest or the promise is still before them and worthy of the sacrifice and perseverance in any generation. And I finish with this, Jesus never said it would be easy to continue believing until the end. He just said it would be worth it. And we have to believe what He says. He said He would raise from the dead and He did. He says He'll raise us from the dead and He will despite the difficulty in maintaining that belief and persevering in our walk as Christians, we need to just keep on going because the promise is absolutely sure. Okay, we'll stop right there and we'll pick it up next week. Thank you for your attention.